Hi, this is Ms. Delosier, and these are your notes on the classes of microorganisms. So uh, what we want to talk about in these notes are the main different categories of microorganisms that we're going to study this nine weeks, um, and also some just basic introduction words that we're going to talk about. Uh, so the first thing that I think we need to cover is the difference between pathogenic and non-pathogenic, because it's important that you know which one we're talking about. Um, in lab. So non-pathogenic microorganisms are the ones that we're going to deal with uh, in class. So any microorganisms that I give you in class are going to be just normal microorganisms that can be found on your skin, um, on surfaces in the classroom, growing on food, although I wouldn't ingest them, but, um, but just normal bacteria, fungus, um, things like that. Uh, they do not produce disease. Most of these are in fact going to be beneficial uh, microorganisms. Then there's pathogenic bacteria, pathogenic uh, fungus, pathogenic protists. Pathogenic basically just means that it is capable of causing an infection or a disease. Um, what may be non-pathogenic in one body system could be pathogenic in another body system. So for example, there are many, 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 many different strains of E. coli. And um, the E. coli that we have normally that live in our intestines are not pathogenic to us. But that does not mean that if you consume E. coli that comes in um, undercooked meat, that that is not going to be pathogenic in your system. Um, salmonella that is found on most reptiles and most birds is most def definitely going to be pathogenic if you are exposed to it where it doesn't necessarily affect the birds and the reptiles in that way. So just keep that in mind. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is the difference between aerobic and anaerobic uh, microorganisms. Aerobic just means that it requires oxygen to live. Anaerobic means that it does not require oxygen to live. There are microorganisms that we'll talk about that are um, anaerobic by default, like they can't actually live in an oxygen-rich environment. However, some anaerobic microorganisms can live in oxygen, but don't require oxygen. And we'll talk about the difference in that when we actually get to those microorganisms specifically. I just need you to know that those vocabulary aerobic versus anaerobic. So let's talk about the six classes of microorganisms. The first one's obviously going to be bacteria. The second is protozoa. Uh, and we'll talk about the difference between protozoa and bacteria when we get to protozoa. The third is fungi. Um, the fourth is rickettsia, um, which is actually a subcategory of bacteria. But um, based on how they're transmitted, we're going to talk about them separately. Uh, then is viruses. And then the last category is helminths. So let's talk a little bit about each of those six classes of microorganisms, just so you have an overview of what we're talking about. We're going to actually spend time on each of these categories as we go through the nine weeks. So bacteria are the, the class of microorganisms that we're most familiar with, um, and they're often cause, considered to be a cause of disease. Um, however, a lot of them are actually really helpful. So let's talk about some of the things that bacteria do. Um, we actually use bacteria to produce antibiotics. Bacteria don't like other species of bacteria in their space. They don't like to share food. So sometimes they produce chemicals that will actually kill off um, competing strains of bacteria. So we'll actually take those chemicals and we use them to actually help us make antibiotics. Um, so a lot of bacteria live in our body without any problems. They live on the roots of certain plants and they help them convert nitrogen into a usable form, which is the basis for a large portion of our ecosystem. They help break down dead and organic matter. They make a lot of our food. Um, so I, I don't want you to, be, to freak out every time we say the word bacteria because a lot of bacteria are really, really helpful. Uh, we classify bacteria by shape and arrangement, um, and so you'll have to learn some words that help us classify um, the shape. So when I give you the name of a bacteria, you should be able to tell me basically what it looks like. Bacteria are the only type of microorganisms that we can treat with antibiotics. So if you go to the doctor and he prescribes you or she prescribes you an antibiotic for a virus, that's wrong. You only treat bacteria with antibiotics. Um, and we'll talk about the repercussions of the overuse of antibiotics in the next week or two.
So over time, um, actually, I guess we're going to talk about it right now. Um, some bacteria develop resistance to antibiotics, and the mechanism for that's what we're going to talk about next week. Um, and so that antibiotic resistant makes it very difficult to cure those bacteria. So examples for that are like methicillin-resistant staphylococcus, which we call MRSA, or multidrug-resistant staphylococcus, which is MDSA. Um, the other one that we've already talked about in pathophysiology is the uh, antibiotic-resistant tuberculosis, and we're going to be talking a lot about all of those resistant bacteria strains um, in a project that we're going we're gonna to start pretty soon. The next category is a protozoa. Um, now, the difference between a protozoa and a bacteria is pretty specific. It's because they're both one-celled, right? They're both one-celled organisms. And um, specifically, a protozoa is a one-celled animal-like organism, meaning that um, it doesn't conduct photosynthesis. So it has to consume other one-celled organisms to get its, its nutrition. Um, but the big difference between them is that a protozoa contains a nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles. Uh, also, when you look at protozoa compared to bacteria, protozoa are huge compared to bacteria. We're going to do a scale activity really early this nine weeks, and you'll be able to see the difference between them. But they are both still single-cell organisms. The reason they're classified differently is the presence of a nucleus in a protozoa. So an example of a protozoa would be like a paramecium or an amoeba. Uh, fungi are our next class. Fungus are organisms that uh, usually enjoy a symbiotic uh, relationship with, with animals and plants, but sometimes can actually form a parasitic relationship with their host. Um, we get a lot of our drugs and food from fungus. Penicillin is actually the result of, of, um, of bread mold. Um, uh, yeast is a type of fungus, so anything that is actually going to be requiring yeast to cook it is, is going to be dependent on fungus. Uh, so they provide the bubbles in bread, in champagne, in beer. Uh, they do, however, cause a number of plant and animal diseases. And the problem with fungal diseases is that they are very, very difficult to treat. Um, so in that bottom left-hand picture right there is an example of uh, fungus underneath a microscope. And actually, hopefully, you guys will be able to isolate that fungus. Uh, early in the semester and you'll be able to get your own pictures of that and then obviously the picture on the right is a fungal infection of the fingernails. Our next category is rickettsia. Uh, rickettsia are actually rod-shaped parasitic bacteria. Um, so as I said that they are a, a, a subcategory of bacteria. They're a little weird because they live in the tissues of ticks and fleas and lice and so instead of getting these bacteria from just being exposed to bacteria you get them because they're transmitted to you through um, through bites of, of, um, of these vector animals, so ticks, fleas, and lice. Uh, so they're dependent on, on these insects, and once they bite you, they transmit the microorganism into you, and then they're going to go ahead and infect you. So the treatment of them is different. Uh, also, the symptoms are going to be different. And it's harder to diagnose because it's it, they tend to be a little, um, a little hidden. You know, you know when you get food poisoning, you know pretty much right away that you have food poisoning. But some of these bacterial infections you don't know about until sometimes the damage has already been done. Our next category is viruses. You've all had a viral infection at one point or another. Uh, because the common cold and the flu are both viral infections. So viruses are small infectious agents. Um, they require a host, specifically a host cell for survival. Uh, viruses are not cellular, therefore they're not considered alive because they, they actually don't, they don't have a cell membrane, they don't have their own uh, mechanisms to replicate themselves. Viruses are essentially um, uh strand of nucleic acids, RNA or DNA, surrounded by a protein coat and sometimes a lipid um, coat. And they infect your cells and they take over your cells and they start making copies of themselves. But if they don't have a host cell available to them, they don't do anything. So there's over 5,000 different types of viruses and they can combine in multiple ways and they produce a wide range of diseases. Um, because they're very simple structurally, they, they mutate very, very quickly. Um, and so uh, 
while we can create antiviral drugs and vaccines to go ahead and protect the human population from viruses, um, we, we have to get those vaccines updated as the viruses mutate, which is why you have to get a new flu shot every year. Uh, viruses actually do produce a, an immune response in humans. And we'll talk, um, for those of you that are new to the class, we'll talk more about that immune response later. For those of you that were in pathophysiology, you should remember that whole vaccination um, immune response thing. And, and that's basically what we're doing when we, when we give you a, a vaccine for a virus. And then the last category is helminths. Helminths are parasitic worm-like organisms. Um, and so things like intestinal worms and they live inside the host. So they live inside you or they live inside your dog or they live inside a pig and they feed off of the host directly. Um, so they might be stealing nutrients directly from you. They might actually be feeding on your tissues. And so this disrupts your nutrition absorption and leads to a lot of those um, nutritional deficiencies that we talked about and causes of disease last nine weeks. It leads to weakness. Um, these helminths excrete toxins, uh, which weaken your immune system farther and make you uh, susceptible to other diseases. And there's approximately 30 billion people globally that are infected with some type of parasitic worm, and a lot of people aren't even aware of their infection. So that's it for the classes of microorganisms. Um, as I said at the beginning, we're going to spend time on each of these classes individually, and we'll um, do little mini projects on them along the way. We're going to start with the most obvious type bacteria. So if you have questions about one of the general categories other than bacteria, please come see me and we'll talk about them before uh, you forget what those questions are. But if it's on bacteria, just jot it down because we're going to start those immediately.